Good morning and welcome to First UMC Randleman. I'm Reverend Jenna Grogan and today is the 13th day of June in the year of our Lord 2021. Our reading today comes from 1 Samuel chapter 16 verses 1 through 13. Let us hear a word from our Lord. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him trembling and said, Do you come peacefully? And he said, Peacefully I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest son, but he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day, day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. My mother-in-law loves to do puzzles, and she can sit for hours agonizing over a small piece of cardboard. But she has such satisfaction when she is done. Yet every now and then she'll finish a puzzle only to find that one piece is missing, which means that the picture is incomplete and therefore the work, work isn't finished after all. And although we can see what the picture is, it is less than satisfying to have that missing piece. And we can understand that because sometimes our lives look just like that. Everything else is intact except that one elusive piece, that thing that we cannot even put our fingers on. And sometimes we can even feel like an insignificant piece, not a border piece, or even one that stands out. Just a small lost blending in with the carpet piece of cardboard. But when we feel that way, we need to remember that we are not insignificant and we are not lost, that we are part of God's puzzle, part of his picture. We are needed and valued and planned for. In fact, even when it doesn't appear that we are important at all, we are because we fit somewhere in God's puzzle and only he knows exactly where. So I want to pause here for just a minute because when God sent the prophet Samuel to the town of Bethlehem to the house of Jesse to anoint one of Jesse's sons to be the next king of Israel. Samuel was afraid 
And he said to the Lord, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. Yet, church, we need to understand that fear is as lethal to us as paralysis of the brain is. It makes our thoughts become arthritic and our memory sluggish. In fact, it is the kind of feeling that makes a graceful person stumble. Fear literally traps time and holds it hostage in a prison of icy anxiety. And that is exactly where we find Samuel. And why? Because he forgot that God is bigger. And so do we. We forget that God is bigger than the pain we are in. Bigger than the debt we owe. Bigger than the chaos, the trials. Bigger than the tribulations. But God has placed in the Bible 365 words that say, do not be afraid. That seems to me that God is saying, I don't want you to be afraid. You see, God is not only bigger, but God doesn't want us to fear. Remember, God had an answer for Samuel that calmed Samuel down. He said to him, I want you to take a heifer and tell those who ask that you have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And he did. This prophet slash judge did exactly what God told him to do. And church, whenever we do what God tells us to do, we find ourselves smack dab in the middle of God's will. And when that happens, nothing whatsoever can touch us. Amen? Amen. So when Samuel told the elders why he had come, he also called the family of Jesse to attend the sacrifice. And when Jesse's sons entered the room, he, Samuel, thought God's choice would be one of Jesse's older sons. After all, they were all big, strong, manly men, important pieces of the puzzle, border pieces. In fact, they fit perfectly the image of a king. But that's not how God saw them. That's why he kept whispering to Samuel, no, he's not the one. Nope, him either. Nope, not even him. And when Jesse had paraded all of his big, strong, manly sons before Samuel, the prophet then asked, are these all of your sons? And Jesse answered, well, no, they're still the youngest son but he is attending the sheep. So I want to pause here again because the Hebrew word for youngest son is hagathon, and it implies more than mere age. In fact, it suggests rank. After all, the hagathon was more than just the youngest son. He was the little brother, the baby, the runt of the litter. He was the one who had to chop the wood. He had to follow the dictates of mom. He had to carry the water and tend the sheep, all of which were considered menial tasks. And again, we know how that feels because we've all had such thankless tasks. In fact, my first job was to clean my father's office. I would vacuum and dust and polish the mirrors and clean toilets. And it was far from glamorous, and it didn't pay very much. But in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, St. Paul writes, You must stand firm, unshakable, excelling in the work of the Lord as always, because you know that your labor isn't going to be nothing for the Lord. So we need to remember that those jobs where we trudge into work every day and we do what we have been called to do with as much energy as we can muster and then we trudge back home again are still opportunities to bring glory to God. That's what Paul is saying here. He's saying that when we look at what we are doing as being done for the Lord, then we have every reason in the world to be happy. And get this, God's Spirit always supplies us with the energy we need as well as joy in the job. And that's where we find David. We find him working at a mundane, same old, same old job, guarding his father's flock, yet 
filled with the joy of being in the presence of the Lord. And remember, church, that this is the same David who established and inhabited the world's most famous city, Jerusalem. This is the same David who wrote many of the Psalms, including the 23rd Psalm and Psalm 51. This is the same David who became king and giant killer. In fact, the Son of God himself was called the Son of David. However, today in this reading, his dad, Jesse, doesn't even include him in the family meeting. In fact, as Max Lucado puts it, he's just a forgotten, uncredentialed kid. But church, you can't tell what's in you by looking at you. Because right now, at this very minute, God is establishing in us patience, character, and concentration in the school of nothing seems to be happening. And remember, just because God promises to move in your life and anoints you, to do a particular something doesn't mean that your foundation is ready. So I want to rest here again. Because Saul, as we know, was the first king anointed by God. And te technically, he was more moral than David in that he didn't struggle in some of the areas that plagued David. And Saul looked a great deal like a king, while David looked like a freckled face, still awkward kid. However, Saul's stately demeanor, demeanor and pompous gait didn't stop him from being a liar. Even when he was face to face with the prophet and judge Samuel, Saul lied when he should have repented. And that's because he was more concerned about what others saw in him than what God saw in him. So listen to me, because none of us have diplomatic immunity to the laws of God. We are all under them. There are no exceptions. The truth is not something we can manipulate to further our own needs. It is not something we can twist and spin in order to serve us, because we are not masters of the truth. We are servants of the truth, and when we break it, it breaks us. So Saul represents that part of us that we must deal with, that we literally have to overthrow. We have to stop lying if we are going to go beyond the superficial to the supernatural. You see, church, Saul's heart was filled with love of self, whereas David's heart was filled with love of God. And that's what God wanted. That's what God always wanted. He saw in David something that nobody else saw. He saw in David a God-seeking heart. And that's what God wants in us. He wants our hearts. In church, the condition of our heart is always expressed through our lives. The condition of our heart is evident by our attitudes, our words, and our behaviors. And when we are willing to follow the directives of the Lord, the condition of our hearts shine. You see, there's this gradual transference of authority as we walk with Jesus. We move from Saul-like rule of superficial religion to divinic anointing based on honesty and transparency. And that's because we understand that God alone is the Lord. And as our Lord, we know that He is, has complete authority to direct our lives. As our Lord, He chooses our careers. He leads us to our spouse. He helps us set our daily priorities. As our Lord, He also knows how to make our marriages strong and how to, uh, what is best for our children. He knows all of those things because He is Lord. And our part is to be good managers of what he has given to us and to obey him as he leads us to be more Christ-like. And remember, if your heart is pure, you're going to approach life without malice. You're not going to question the motives of everyone around you. 
You're not going to doubt what others tell you, and you're not going to look for a fault in them. Instead, you're going to look for the get, the good in them, and you are going to find what is praiseworthy in them. In fact, if our heart is pure, we see others exactly the way God sees them. Remember, church, that the world looks at us and deems us worthy only if we're pretty or handsome or smart or wealthy or if we come from a good family or we have a great talent. But God examines our hearts and when he finds a heart that is set on him, he calls it and he claims it. So I want to rest here again. Because sometimes we will be tempted to take shortcuts to reach our goal. After all, David was tempted. In fact, he was tempted many times before he finally assumed the throne. Remember that Samuel had just anointed David and even prophesied that he would be the next king of Israel. Yet while David waited on God's timing, he watched in frustration as a crazed King Saul brought the kingdom into jeopardy. And to top it all off, Saul was trying to kill David. But when David found Saul in a vulnerable position, asleep, surrounded by his own arm, army, an incredible opportunity presented itself to David, for he could have killed Saul. And it made perfect sense. After all, Saul was trying to murder David, and God had said that David was to be the next king. In fact, by taking matters into his own hands, he could have brought Saul's reign to an end and assumed the throne as God's anointed a lot sooner than he did. But he refused to compromise his integrity. In Deuteronomy 6.18, we are told, You shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord. And that's what David did. And yet standing up for what is right is not always easy to do because it takes a great deal of courage. In fact, some people feel it's much easier to go with the flow of whatever is popular at the time or to simply avoid the issue altogether. But sadly, that can and indeed has led to an entire culture of weak, misguided, and apathetic people. So if you believe in something that's good and that's honest and that's right, then stand up for it. And remember that even though David wanted the throne and even though it was in fact rightfully his, David waited on the Lord. In 2 Peter 3 verse 8 we read, With the Lord a single day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a single day. And although this truth is difficult to wrap our minds around, it is still true. Our timetable is not God's. His ways are higher than our ways. So as we wait, we need to learn to be patient. And we need to learn to trust Him. And we need to learn to watch over our hearts. So I want to pause here again. Because God is behind everything that happens in our lives. Life is not random. Our God is in control. Let me repeat that. Our God is in control. Even when he allows trials to enter into our life, he is at work making everything come out for our good. And you need to own this truth. In fact, you need to take it into the very core of your being. And no, I, I don't know how he does it. It's a mystery of the cross. After all, wicked men crucified Jesus out of jealousy and out of anger, and yet God used their act of rage to save us. Think about that. Because if we really think about it, then we will be able to love people who are unlovable, people who are just like Saul. And we can do that because Jesus did that. You see, church, Jesus knew who he was, and he knew what he was called to do. And the Lord wants us to know who we are and what we are graced to do. 
And this knowledge locked up in the counsel of the Lord's mind is the basis of our seeking. For it is in the knowing that God has a plan for us that we are transformed. And get this, because God is with us, he also knows the hopes of our goals. And he reveals himself to people who seek him. You see, church, the finders are the seekers. Now, some people have the knack to look at a run-down, dilapidated building and see past the mess to the potential. They can envision new paint or new carpet or hardwood floors. In their minds, they're able to remove walls and add new features. In fact, they can transform this dilapidated mess into a diamond that sparkles with light. And God does the very same thing with us. He looks at us and sees in us diamonds in the rough. He looks beyond our sin and our inadequacy and he focuses instead on our potential. In fact, in God's eyes, he sees greatness and he knows the plans that he has for us. By God's design, the intricate details of the life of David, whose passions were both an asset and a liability, were left for us on the pages of Scripture. His inner struggles and his childhood dysfunctions are openly aired on the pages of the text, like the center fold out in a tabloid. And God displayed David's failures to give us a point of reference for God's grace. After all, if God can use a David, then God can use a Jenna, a Steve, a Peggy, a Vicky, a JD. Amen? Amen? So let's pause here one last time. Because in Isaiah 54, 2, we are told by God, Enlarge the sight of your tent and let your tent curtains be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your ropes and drive your pegs deep. You see, church, when God comes to a life in power, it is always a time of rejoicing and expectation for the future. But it is also like that of a child being born to a previously barren woman. And we all know that a baby changes everything and that we have to make room for it. Isaiah proclaims the same thing when he says that when God comes, we have to make room for him. We cannot simply add Jesus onto our lives and carry on with business as usual. We literally must enlarge the place of our tent. That's what David did. Only what he stretched was not a tent. It was his heart. And he did that because he knew that the finders are always those who seek after the heart of God. Now, one might read David's story and wonder just what God saw in him. After all, this is a heart that God loved, but this is also a checkered heart. However, God also knew that David's heart had stretched enough to hold tightly onto him. God knew that David was a very important piece of puzzle, and God knows that we are too. Remember that Jesus didn't come for the perfect for those border pieces. He came for those of us who are sinners and those of us who have hearts that will stretch enough so that he can live within us. David's failures didn't change how the Lord felt about him. He still claims the title of the man after God's own heart. In fact, that's why the initial verse of the first chapter of the first gospel calls Jesus the son of David. God wasn't ashamed of David, and God isn't ashamed of us. He came to claim our hearts, to save us, and then to use us. And church, because God chooses to love us, we have a place in his puzzle. And we will never be lost and never overlooked, for we are his. Please now receive this benediction. 
Stand firm in one spirit, with one mind, and with an open heart. Strive to spread the good news of the gospel and to seek him who seeks you. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.